Good day and welcome to the new networking webinar. My name is Laurie Thompson and I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. We've already done our, done our sound checks, so we're in good shape to get moving. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. All of our participants are in listen-only mode, which means your sound in your office will not interrupt what we're doing here today. We are anticipating a lively Q&A session at the end of our presentation. We're going to hold all questions until then. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the Q&A area, exactly where you helped me with the sound check a few moments ago. Uh, these questions will come directly to me, and I'll do my best to filter and summarize them and send them off to Karen at the appropriate time. So, we are employing a fair amount of technology today, and whenever you do that, you have the possibility of failure. If something goes amok or we run into a snafu, we will do our best to communicate with you through the Citrix toolbar on the right, and I'll also put a slide up on the screen if that's a possibility. That ends the housekeeping portion of things today, and I'll turn our meeting over to Greg Marshall, also from Aceware, who will introduce our speaker. Greg? Well, I'd like to introduce Deuce Karen and Karen uh, Southwall Watts. Uh, Karen and I go way back. Uh, she was an instructor for many years at Watson Community College uh, in my business, CE business program. Uh, Karen also teaches for Bellingham Technical College, uh, teaching various business and management team skills. Um, Karen does a lot of different things. Um, she's a great presenter, so I thought it would be great to bring her on board and talk a little bit about the, the new networking that we are experiencing. So I'm going to go ahead and let Karen get started. Karen, yay! Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Southall Watts, and for the next while I'll be talking to you about the new networking. Many years ago when an associate literally had to talk me into joining Facebook, I never dreamed that by 2010 I'd end up speaking to a packed room at a communications conference about social media. Realizing that online social media platforms were just a new tool that I could add to my networking and business strategy toolbox allowed me to enjoy social media and reach out to a bigger audience with my ideas. Like many people, Facebook was my first step into the world of online networking, and it was the favorite network of most of today's attendees who had a particular favorite at the time of registration. Facebook, like other platforms, encourages us to hang out and spend a lot of time on site enjoying interactions with each other. This may be the reason that most of today's attendees also cited planning time for social media as a main concern. So over the next few minutes, I hope to give you some ideas about tackling the challenges of the new networking. We have a wealth of communications tools available today. Modern technology has not only expanded our workday, but our individual reach out into the global community. However, mastering the use of electronic tools is not enough. The most successful among us find a way to blend new technology and trends with a solid understanding of human relationships. I'll be discussing some of the more popular social media and web-based tools, but not delving into the technology setup. The focus of this presentation is the blending point, that intersection between technology and communication skills. Groups for personal and professional growth are nothing new. In 1727, Benjamin Franklin formed a club for mutual improvement. Like the networking groups before and since, this group allowed members to exchange ideas and build productive relationships. Generations later, the private salons and pub meetings would give way to business breakfasts and chamber of commerce, chamber of commerce after hours parties. These traditional networking functions are typically limited by geography and regular business hours. Widespread use of the internet and social media platforms has allowed us to connect with colleagues and customers without these restrictions. However, merely exchanging electronic information does not create a true relationship, and it's the relationships that build careers and build businesses. As you begin developing these relationships, it's useful to know who's online and what you might expect from them. Thought leaders are the people who've been recognized by their peers, and often the rest of us, as having a certain level of expertise in their field. 
Thought leaders can be individuals who brought what we now consider classical wisdom to the public, people like Thomas Jefferson, Martin Luther King Jr., or Eleanor Roosevelt. Or they can be people who are introducing new and exciting ways to consider problems and consider life. We often see classical thought leaders quoted online in tweets and posts, while more contemporary thought leaders present their own new content through blogs, interviews, podcasts, and publishing new books. Followers, and to some extent this includes all of us, use online tools to follow, or in other words, stay informed about the activities and ideas that others post online. We can find out when our favorite authors publish new books, stay informed of news within a particular industry, and read the latest ideas from colleagues and competitors by following. Friends are a little bit different. For years I have mentioned to those who venture into online relationships the words of Aristotle, who said, friendship is a single soul dwelling in two bodies. And then I asked them, are your connections on Facebook really your friends? It's important to keep in mind that some dynamics of friendship and other relationships flourish best with an element of privacy. And then, of course, there are problem children. No matter what environment you create, sadly, there's always someone who chooses to take advantage of it to make mischief. An online profile opens the door to security problems, which we'll address again later, and blindly clicking links that come from contacts that you don't know well can leave you open to hacking and computer viruses. As we incorporate all this new technology into our daily lives, our businesses, and even our personal relationships, our expectations around communications have changed. Email and text messaging allow us to exchange information more quickly and conveniently than ever before. However, electronic communications have created an expectation of instant response. When this expectation of an instant response or an immediate reply goes unmet, and you follow up with dozens of why haven't you replied texts or messages, you risk seeming desperate or inconsiderate. In a professional setting, an expectation of an instant response, especially in contrast to the realities of a complex problem, can make you seem immature or like you're lacking in expertise. So we've reached a point where we're going to ask you a question to see if everybody's paying attention and have you raise your virtual hand and tell us, do you blog? So if you'll look in the upper left-hand corner of the Citrix toolbar, there's a small hand icon. If you click it once, your fingers go up and your vote is counted. And if you click it twice, the hand raises and then goes down. And like the hanging chad scenario, no vote is counted. So if you would please raise your hand. And we'll give it just a few seconds. And while we wait for people to vote and for the software to um, count your vote, I, I will say, uh, quoting Aristotle, Karen, really, I, I, <laughs> I have a whole new respect now for classical philosophers because of that. <laughs> you related it to social media. <laughs> I, I am the person who can take the vague thing you were forced to study in college and somehow relate it to your everyday work. That is my challenge. <laughs> so glad you're not a mathematician. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> And it looks like about 20% of our audience is blogging. So that's good. That's excellent. That's awesome. OK. That, and blogging is a good way to build your personal brand online. It's also a good way to generate support for a cause. I have a lot of contacts who work for social causes. And they use a blog to spread the message. And some people do it just because it's fun. It gives the, them a way to get that inner writer out, which takes me to the next point, which is, just as technology has allowed us to feel like we're all connected, all of these new online tools also allow us to feel like we're all writers. Blogging, simple web, web page templates, discussion groups, article collecting websites, all of these have made it possible for us to put out our own ideas, often called content, without going through a gatekeeper like an editor, a reporter, or a book publisher. The trade-off for all this access is often a flurry of mistakes. 
despite the fact that most of us don't use English that's as formal as our parents or our grandparents, sloppy writing gives out negative signals in professional circles. Misspelled words, poor grammar, poorly checked facts, or crude language indicates at best that you're a rushed or careless writer. At its worst, it's a message that you, as a writer, don't respect your readers. The other consequence of our new content-rich world is that once you make a mistake and it goes online, it goes worldwide very quickly. And nothing feels worse than knowing some mistake you've made has gone viral. So go ahead and enjoy the thrill of bypassing the publishing elite, but don't forget to proofread. And now we're going to ask your opinion. Now that we've asked you to raise your hand, we're going to ask your opinion. Should professionals use emoticons? And emoticons are those little smileys or collections of weird text that we put at the end of a sentence to show how we're feeling about something. And so I'd like to know how you feel about the use of emoticons. And we have a poll. And here it is. Karen, I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but should professionals use emoticons? Yes, no, it's okay sometimes, and I'm not sure. Select one and only one, and we'll watch the votes come in. This is part of my favorite part of running a webinar is when I get <laughs> to watch the votes come in, because I feel like, you know, ABC before the, everybody gets to see the broadcast. <laughs> Looks like we have about 75% of our audience has voted, so we'll give it just a couple more seconds to see if we can get some more people in. It usually takes about a minute to get okay. going. And, and I don't actually vote. get to see the poll, but I do have a lovely message that tells me you're conducting the poll. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I'm surprised at these results. So we're going to close it in three, two, one. I will close the poll, and I will share the results with you. Okay. Nobody said yes. Nobody Thir said yes. Okay. Nobody said yes. 39% said no. 57% said it's okay sometimes, and 4% said they were not sure. So. Okay. So I fall down most of the time firmly in the it's okay sometimes <laughs> category. I like the vagueness of that category. Proofreading for mistakes is just the first step to better online communications. And for years, experts have told us that a lot of what we communicate comes through as nonverbal. It's either body language or some other type of cues. And ask anybody who's ever met a teenager, and you'll realize that it's not always what you say, but how you say it. A simple yes, no, or a thank you can sound like an insult with the right tone of voice. So unless you utilize video or audio, and even though they're very effective, they're not always an option, there's no tone of voice online. And so one way to deal with that challenge is the use of emoticons to convey emotion behind your words. There's a lot of debate about this, which is why we included the poll question here, as to whether or not they belong in professional communication. As you might expect, there's a firm, hard camp that says never. And then there's a fairly large whenever you want to camp. I feel like it's best to rely on your traditional writing skills for communications with people that you don't know. You can always add a more casual tone, more casual language, and things like emoticons to messages once you've established a relationship with the other partner. Because your contacts can't hear you unless you're using audio or video, it's important to watch your use of emotionally charged words, especially if you're in a discussion forum or a live chat, because it's really hard to take those things back classifying or criticizing people based on political language or religious language or using racial terms can quickly shut down your productive discussion and create an online argument. And if you insult the intelligence of people who disagree with you, you will not only not win your debate, but you will probably destroy your online reputation. There are dozens and dozens of tools for communicating and connecting online. And by the time we finish this webinar, there could be even more new platforms for sending out content and networking with colleagues. It's virtually impossible to master all of the available social media tools, though there are some social media gurus who claim to have done so. 
This is the reason I've chosen today to focus on the ones that I'm the most familiar with, but I encourage you to research all the tools that are out there and find the networks that fit your plan the best. You cannot hang out online 24 hours a day all the time, so it's essential that you have some kind of a plan for how you spend your time and then where you're going to put that effort in which channel it's going to go. Like any good plan, your social media and networking plan should include goals, and the goals should reflect your personal values as well as your professional ambitions. Based on what you hope to accomplish and a solid knowledge of your client base, your customers, your industry peers, then you select your social media channels. For example, if you want to connect with HR executives, the best place to start might be LinkedIn. If you want to stir up a grassroots support for a cause, then Twitter or Facebook are great places to spread the word to lots of people. If you aren't sure where your clients or customers or peers hang out, then join a couple of networks and do what we call lurk, which means you follow, you read, you pay attention to what's happening and who's hanging around in those networks. Then you select a couple of channels to really start working your plan. Once you start spending time online doing the new networking, you're going to want to know if your efforts are paying off. And clout and cred are the number one and two tools that claim to measure your influence online. Each gives you a number that's supposed to tell you how you stack up in terms of influencing other people and by extension your mastery of social media. And there are a few issues when you look at these numbers and whether or not you can determine if they are giving an accurate reflection of whether or not your social media plan is on target. Clout doesn't tell us exactly how they determine scores. There are a lot of articles available that suggest that retweets, which is when someone takes something you've tweeted and reposts it again in their feed, mentions and engagement are key. Recently, Clout announced that linking to Instagram, which is an image sharing platform, would give active Instagram users a 5% increase in their Clout scores. However, this leads to the question, does posting fabulous photos online really mean you have more ability to influence someone's behavior? Cred, on the other hand, has made transparency, showing how they determine your online influence score, a major marketing point. They provide users with a vivid graphic representation of the online activities that they've engaged in, evaluated, and then used to create the cred score. While these steps haven't allowed cred to unseat clout as the number one player, they have influenced clout to change the way that they interface with users, and now they have a more visual and more revealing setup on their website. Both of these services are constantly in flux. The real question is, how do these scores reflect your real-world results, and should we be using something else to monitor our social media and networking progress? For example, the week I put these notes together, my Facebook clout score was twice my LinkedIn clout score. However, I've landed lots of paying clients from LinkedIn, and I've never landed any paying work from Facebook. Cred gives me a lot of influence points for my interactions on Twitter, and I can go to their website and see transparently which of those interactions they gave me the most points for. But those interactions don't necessarily reflect what I did that week in the real world and where I really did find I had some influence. Remember those feedback cards you used to find on restaurant tables, hotel desks, and front counters of retail establishments? Business owners still need to know where their customers are coming from and how they felt about the services that they got. The same is true for your social media plan. So it's important to track your results from things besides likes, followers, or retweets. Do a periodic review of your social media plan, I say at least once every six months, and examine the number of minutes you spend on each platform and compare this with your real world results. 
So we have another yes, no question that sort of illustrates this. I'd like you to raise your virtual hand if you've ever heard of Santiago Swallow. <laughs> Even the name has some interesting connotations, yes. it, doesn't it? So if you would please raise your hand again. I just put everyone's hand down so we can get a good count. And again, it looks like we're going to settle on about 20% have heard of Santiago Swallow. Okay. So for those of you who have not, meet the $68 man, Santiago Swallow. In April of 2013, Kevin Ashton, who's the co-founder and former executive director of the MIT Auto ID Center, and now a writer about all things internet, admitted to the world that he was the inventor of Santiago Swallow, supposed internet star. Mr. Ashton generated a fake name and fake expertise for his creation and then purchased Twitter followers, created a Wikipedia biography patterned after Peter Drucker's, and created tweets based on the word game Mad Libs, and Santiago Swallow was born. Less than a day after he was created, Santiago Swallow had a cred influence score of 754 out of 1,000. So he may not be real, but Santiago Swallow is the embodiment of why you need to understand the difference between perceived and real influence. The easiest way to launch your personal social media plan is to look at the big three platforms. So we're going to do a quick review of those. Facebook wasn't the first online network. MySpace was actually first on the scene. But Facebook has become a worldwide, impossible to ignore social media giant. Facebook has outgrown its purely social roots, and it's a viable tool for businesses and other organizations to reach out to the public and to keep stakeholders informed. Now, this morning, just before I got on for this webinar, um, Business Insider posted a story this week, which I found through Twitter, about the fact that between 2011 and 2012, Facebook was the only social media platform that did not see growth in users. So it's big and it's giant, but maybe those days are dwindling. LinkedIn is a networking platform that focuses on making and strengthening professional contacts. Groups within LinkedIn allow community users to discuss issues, exchange information, and promote events or products. And it's also, I find, a good place to find out about best practices in whatever your particular industry is. LinkedIn does have a lot of users, though, who are looking for work. And this can impact the discussions and the way people act and the way people reach out to you when you're on this platform. Twitter can help you reach out to a lot of people. You post short interesting messages. It can help you gain followers, but one of the best uses I find for Twitter is as a pointing device. You can use Twitter to send people to links for news, your own original content, or a website. Some businesses and organizations or individuals offer goods or services that lend themselves to a visual representation. So the best way to reach out may be social media channels that use pictures and video. YouTube is probably the most well-known channel for short videos. It's a great place to post things like virtual tours of a college, how-to videos, or replays of live speeches. Pinterest provides users with an online bulletin board. And if you use Google and look up the term, you'll also find a lively debate on the correct way to pronounce the name of the platform. It's a great site for businesses that sell tangible goods. Once you set up an account, you'll get emails that alert you to new followers and possible other content that you might want to follow. Flickr is another picture-based networking platform. It's a favorite of photographers and other creative types and provides a professional level that's a paid membership that gives more storage than the free option that's open to the public. There's built-in sharing and a link backs 
program for getting images to spread around the web correctly. When Google plunged into the social media game, their stated goal was to make sharing on the web more like sharing in real life. According to G Plus data, Google Plus users are mostly young adults, only half of whom speak English. For some, this may be the perfect community. For others, hanging out in Google Plus is a waste of time. There's also a lot of debate as to how many people who just happen to have Gmail accounts are actually active users of Google Plus. From the beginning, Google Plus has had a lot of self-described techies as members. Google Plus is a great example of why you need to know your audience before spending a lot of time in any particular social media place. I did talk to someone this past week when I went to a technology training who is one of these self-described techies who has a Google Plus account who told me, much like many of my other contacts, he stopped using it because there's never anybody there to talk to. So really, you need to know who's there and what you want to get out of these interactions because I hear this a lot about Google Plus but then I have other people who say it's the best thing that they've ever encountered. Even with all the new technology and tools, social media mastery and effective networking involves relationship building and relationship building cannot happen without respect. You should always take the time to thank people publicly who retweet your content or otherwise spread your message for you. People who recommend you or endorse you and people who engage with you online. You should make your requests to other people direct but polite. For example, I get lots of requests to spread information about websites, books, or blog posts. And I appreciate it if the request comes to me in a professional manner and that it's personalized, that somebody understands exactly what I can contribute to them in the way of a recommendation. Nothing screams networking newbie more than asking a brand new connection for a big favor. Don't ask people you've newly connected to and who may need more time to really get to know you to find you a job, sell your product, or forward your sales links. In addition to being considered rude online, this behavior is risky and your smart connections know that. Savvy networkers realize that if they forward your links or recommend your products or services without adequate knowledge, they're risking their own very valuable online reputations. None of your networking or social media activities should happen in isolation. Whenever you meet people in traditional face-to-face -face settings, you should make sure that you've got the ability to direct them to your online information. At the same time, you want to turn your online interactions into real-world results. To do this, it's important that you link everything together. This is one example of what that might look like, how you might talk up your online activities in your live events and use your live events to point people to your online content. Just like you wouldn't turn a toddler loose with a chainsaw, you don't want to jump into social media, professional networking without some kind of plan and foresight. One of the greatest advantages of connecting with other people online is that experienced social media networkers are usually very generous, sharing their tips, their hints, and their personal tales of success or mistakes. So we're going to take another poll now and ask you how often do you review or update your security settings on your social media profiles? And here we go. And Karen, I have to admit, I am one of these people who never does this. <laughs> tisk, tisk. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I will try to be better as a result of your tisk, tisk of that. So. If you would please answer our poll, but I notice that seldom is your first opportunity. You know, it's your first choice for people to vote. <laughs> and that's based on what I hear from people in real life. Yes. 
we've got about 75% of our audience has voted. We'll give it another 10 or 15 seconds because sometimes even after people vote, it takes a few seconds to get it back and get it counted and placed in the graph. So you don't see like the percentage of people who voted go up by single digits. It normally goes uh -huh. up five or six percent at a time. So to increase our anticipation, I'm sure. Yes, probably. <laughs> All righty. I think we're going to close it in three, two, one, and I will share the results with you. So a lot of people in the same category and in what you anticipated would be the, the primary response. 56% said seldom or when I hear someone's been hacked or the platform has a problem. Uh, nobody said every week or every month so as part of their regular routine. 36% said a few times a year. In 8%, there are security settings. <laughs> so that's not surprising to me, sadly. And even though it sounds very efficient, option two, every week, every month, what I actually recommend people do is do it a few times a year when they make other major changes and link it mentally to something you would be doing anyhow. So often I tell clients, when you do your spring cleaning, change all your passwords, change your security settings, update your profile settings, blanket all that stuff together. Um, and I was reminded the last time I put out a tweet about this, somebody said, and change the batteries in your smoke detector. So something that you would normally be doing anyway, just put your security settings under that same umbrella and you're more likely to do it than if you have to invent a new time to do it every week or invent a new time to do it every month. Um, a lot of people do periodic cleaning out of their email and their other stuff during holiday breaks. So if you're working an academic calendar, you get a break for spring break, you get a break for Christmas. Um, that's a good time to change your security settings, change your passwords, and I also recommend that you unsubscribe from newsletters that are no longer useful to you. So rake it under there with something you would be doing anyway, and you're more likely to do it. Of course, one of the best things you can do for the online community is to share your own tips. And I encourage you to let your friends and colleagues know what's worked for you and what hasn't worked for you. That thing that you figured out ages and ages ago could be the new piece of information your colleague has been struggling to find this week. And so we're going to go back through the big three and just sort of look at some of the basics because the thing that I figured out last week may be the thing that you need tomorrow. So before you set up a LinkedIn account, I recommend that you have the following things online, on your desk. A clear digital photo of your face or your company logo, a current copy of your resume and highlights of your work history, and a list of questions you'd like to ask other people in your field or some current content that you can share. And the reason you want to have all this ready ahead of time is so that you can create a complete profile as quickly as possible. Many experienced LinkedIn members will ignore requests to connect from people who have incomplete profiles or profiles without a picture. Then you can start sending out invitations to connect and always personalize them. Don't just use the little pop-up form. Add something to it. I like it when potential connections remind me of where we might have met or what groups that we share. Be sure to add a list of skills to your profile. This allows your connections to endorse you for your abilities. The relatively new skills endorsement tool is not without some controversy. Everybody doesn't love it. Don't allow yourself to be convinced to endorse people for skills that you have no knowledge of. And don't expect reciprocal endorsements from your connection. So just because you say Mary Smith has the skill of public speaking, don't expect Mary Smith to come back and endorse you for the skill of proofreading. Join groups that share your profession, your interests, or your geographic location. And then you can begin participating in discussions. 
These discussions allow you to ask questions as well as demonstrate your own expertise. And as I said earlier, they're a great place to find out about best practices in your industry. It's important to decide where Facebook is going to fit in your professional social media plans. Some people choose to reserve Facebook for strictly social or personal purposes, while others try to integrate all parts of their lives and their online presence across all platforms. Almost all platforms update and change with little notice to users. Facebook, however, has been notorious for changing things like the privacy and security setting defaults and notifying users after the fact. So as you budget your social media time, if you're using Facebook a lot, make sure you include a regular review of the settings in your Facebook account. Be especially cautious about allowing other people to post things to your Facebook wall, and don't be afraid to use the hide function if you need it. Twitter is like any other platform in that you should have a complete profile and some objectives in mind. Businesses and organizations may choose to use their logo instead of a photo because that gives them a stronger brand statement. Services like Future Tweets or tools like Hootsuite will allow you to plan your tweets in advance and schedule them. Scheduled tweets allow you to post content and interact 24 hours a day, and this can keep you fresh in the minds of your network. However, scheduled routine tweets can make you look like you're out of touch. If they fall during a major news event or a crisis, it can make you seem uninformed or uncaring. For example, during the aftermath of the tornadoes, I had people who were still posting lots of sales tweets in the middle of all the Red Cross posting. That made me tune those people out. Overscheduled tweets can make your stream of content seem like white noise and then your followers will just start ignoring you. Direct messages, or DMs, allow you to quickly and privately correspond with your followers. Many Twitter users send an automatically generated direct message to their new followers, often with a link to a website, a squeeze page, or another offering. Without time and some relationship development, if you do this, don't expect a lot of people to click through on these, since hacked Twitter accounts, and it does happen, often churn out direct messages that lead to malicious links. A key to engagement on Twitter is knowing when topics are trending, and knowing when people are seeking you or your area of expertise. Hashtags provide an easy way for you to search out names and topics, and a platform like Hootsuite allows you to see mentions of your name in a separate little frame. 140 characters can seem like a real communications challenge. It can be even tougher when you start to consider getting retweets. Consider whether or not your tweets are retweet friendly. So they need to be short enough that someone else can come back and repost them in their own feed without vital information getting cut off. So here are some general tips that I often give to people who are new to social media or people who tend to forget these things. Just like you never dream of going to a job interview or a presentation impaired, you should never post comments online if you've been drinking, sick, or haven't slept. And I would have to say, along the lines of sickness, it's okay to tell your followers that you are ill, you're under the weather, you're not going to be communicating online. I personally don't want to see all the gooey details of your illness. If you've got great content to share, post it a couple of times. Try to hit the most popular days of the week and the most popular time zones for your particular followers. And before you post a link to a really juicy news story, double check to make sure it's legitimate. There are a lot of groups that exist simply to generate pretend news, usually in the name of humor. You don't want someone else's joke to make you look silly or uninformed. The most successful new networkers have a plan. This is a simple uh, sample plan of what a social media schedule might look like. To create a successful social media plan, first you have to understand your people, your potential clients or customers, your peers and your competitors, and where you're most likely to find them online and when you're most likely to find them online. 
What channels are they using? Second, you have to have some goals in mind. Are you trying to build an online reputation for expertise in a certain area? Direct people to a website to buy something or perhaps provide customer support to a brick and mortar business. Those different goals would require a different type of plan. Knowing what you hope to accomplish will help you develop your strategy. Finally, you need to examine your results both virtual and offline. If you're not getting the exposure, the clicks, or the sales that you need, it's time to reevaluate your plan and you may not want to wait for six months if you find you're getting lots and lots of silence. So here are a couple of the personal strategies that I use. I set aside one hour a day specifically to work on my new networking. Sometimes I spend more, sometimes I spend less, but I check in every day at about the same time. I do most of my posting in a time slot that straddles my two main groups of potential clients. So I post mid-morning on the West Coast and I still catch the attention of my East Coast audience where I still travel to do presentations and I get them before the end of their business day. I prune my LinkedIn groups periodically. Groups that no longer interest me or groups where the discussions have declined or degraded are not a good use of my time, so I leave those groups. And then I try to use a simple ratio in my postings, at least three gives for every take. That means I try to interact in some way with my network by retweeting someone else's content, replying to other people, posting news items of general interest about three times for every time I post my own content or promote my own work. Uh, most importantly, I try to stay receptive to new information as well as recommendations from friends and colleagues. Just during the last couple of days before this webinar, LinkedIn announced a new security option for mobile devices. Facebook had a public grappling with how to require users to use their real names to cut down on what they called cruel and insensitive language. And at least half a dozen people within my network posted lists of rules and pointers for using Twitter. So with so much new information available, it's almost impossible to thrive in the new networking environment without having in your schedule a certain amount of time to research new changes. And I like to take whatever time we have left to ask you if you have any questions, and hopefully I'll have those answers. Well, excellent information, Karen. I really appreciate it. And I do have a couple of questions that have come in during our meeting. OK. Uh, can you tell us exactly what is your personal branding? My personal branding? Well, you know, it's changed over the last couple of years. I used to say that I helped people deal with problems in business and in life. And I still do that, but now I'm just sort of sticking with the whole Ask Karen kind of thing, which is my Twitter handle. People just come to me to ask questions, and I, I kind of make myself receptive to that. I have found that personal branding grows and changes over time, and the thing you thought you were an expert in often turns into something else over time. Okay. Um, have you ever worked with Foursquare, and would this work better for continuing ed markets? I have never worked with Foursquare primarily because of the type of work that I do. Location is not a key for me. I think the people who really get the most out of Foursquare that I've seen within my network are people who are doing retail stuff where the location matters. Uh, I just don't have a lot of experience with it because I do so much stuff online and when I go somewhere it's planned well in advance. I show up and I give my speech or my workshop. So Foursquare hasn't really been a big tool for me. Okay. If you've never done any social media before today, and it's none. What should your action plan be for the rest of the week? And this combines several questions. Uh, what's step one? What are your recommended goals for somebody that's never done any social media before? All those kind of questions, I'm lumping them all together. So okay. anybody that had something like that, ears perk up, please. Okay, so I have a lot of clients like this, actually. And um, 
the first thing I ask them to do is to determine what they want to get out of social media. So for instance, I have clients who are writers and their primary goals involve developing a reputation online. And so they are looking at doing things like blogging and setting up their own website and Twitter so that they can point people to their blog and their website. Then I have people who want to sell stuff. If you want to sell stuff, then Facebook is sometimes a great place to start. So you have to figure out, first of all, what do I want to accomplish? Once you've figured out what you want to accomplish with your social media plan, then you can start researching the different channels and trying to decide which ones are going to be a match for you. If you've never, ever, ever done social media or you've only dipped your toe in, you know, say, Facebook to keep in touch with Aunt Susie, then I wouldn't recommend trying to start off with too many channels at once. Pick one or two that you think meet your needs. So let's say you're going to sell products. You might want to pick one of the visually oriented channels like Pinterest uh, or Flickr. So you can post images of the products that you're going to sell and tie those back to your website. A lot of educators like to use YouTube because they can use give little mini lectures and then point people back to the website for the university or the college, wherever, the, wherever they happen to be working from. So figure out what you're going to do. Pick one or two channels and start with those. Spend some time lurking in your chosen channels. If you choose Twitter as one of your channels, one of the easiest things to do is start following the people that you consider to be the thought leaders in your field. And as you follow them, lots and lots of stuff will be revealed to you about what you think you can do as your next step. So figure out what you want, pick a couple of channels, lurk in those channels, make sure that whichever platform you select, you give yourself a complete profile so people will not be hesitant to connect with you. And then after you've been at it for a few weeks, go back and review and determine whether or not those initial decisions were pointing you in the right direction. And once you're online and you're comfortable within your channel, ask questions of your peers. I have a second Twitter account under a different super secret name where I work with my writing in fiction. And one of the things that I found when I got into Twitter as a fiction writer is that other writers and publishers and other people involved in the book industry were incredibly willing to share information on how they promote themselves online, how they got their last project finished, all kinds of things. So you can put those questions out there once you pick the channel that you think fits the best. Excellent advice, and, and I just have to grin a little bit because I'm old enough that I am sure when I was younger, nobody ever advised me to lurk. That was just not, <laughs> that's one of those words. <laughs> yes, that was not a polite thing to do when I was younger either, but now it's a great strategy because you can learn a lot just by watching the thought leaders in your industry. Uh, is there a site that you frequent for social media information or rules? Well, as you and I discussed yesterday, and let's see if this little thing works here that I put on this last slide, LinkedIn, let's see if it magically works, has a blog where they post information. Is it magically coming up on your screen? We can see it. Do you see that? We do. Protecting your LinkedIn account with two-step verification. So LinkedIn has a blog where they post information on their new features and um, how to use the standard features within the platform. So I often go there if I feel like I need to refresh my LinkedIn skills. Within my own network, I have tons of people who have declared themselves to be social media gurus. And so they are always posting lists of tips and tricks. So the websites that I would go to in any one week change as people post new 
information. Um, Facebook also does some information like LinkedIn for users. I don't find that it comes out in as timely a fashion. Uh, Twitter doesn't post as much as well either. And so for Twitter, if I want pointers on that, I usually rely on the experts within my network. And certainly if you connected with me on Twitter at Ask Karen, I could tell you which of those people that I follow I would recommend for social media newbies to follow. Greg is typing in that he hits Mashable.com frequently and that he also mm -hmm. monitors Bob Dunn's WordPress blog. So you could probably Google Bob Dunn. Do you end yeah. <clears throat> and I do go to Mashable. I just don't think about it as going to Mashable because I usually access it through the Twitter feed of one of my, one of my uh, contacts in uh, Canada. She's sort of a tech goddess. And I often don't think about the website. I just think about it as being her directing me to some place. Okay. And this will be one of our last questions. So if you have any others, please put them in the question answer box quickly so that I can get them to Karen. Uh, how do you pick the right social media channel? Do you have any suggestions for doing that? Um, I try to figure out who I'm, who I'm going to get in touch with. And there are a lot of articles if you just simply go online and Google who's on what channel or who uses you know, fill in the blank. Who uses Facebook? Who uses Google Plus? Who uses whatever? Um, you can get brand new statistics week after week about who's there. I try to figure out who's there and whether or not there are going to be any decision makers there. So for example, if I'm going to deal with corporate people, I often go to LinkedIn because lots of corporate individuals have LinkedIn accounts. If I want to deal with somebody who uh, has the ability to pass my message along, then I want to connect with them through Twitter. And there are a lot of people in Twitter who have thousands and thousands of followers that if I can get them to read my message and retweet it, it goes out to thousands and thousands of followers. In general, uh, Google Plus users are younger. LinkedIn users are slightly older and higher up the career ladder. Um, Twitter covers the gamut in age. And it just depends on who you're following. So there are a lot of younger Twitter users who are following celebrities that I never have any contact with because we're sort of in two separate Twitter verses. So I pick them based on what the research, the latest and greatest research tells me about who's living in which channel at the time. And then I temper that with my own personal experience. As I said earlier, uh, I use Facebook and LinkedIn. I never do business through Facebook. Sometimes I announce business related things there, but by virtue of who my friends are on Facebook, that's not where the business action happens. All righty. Well, Karen, excellent presentation. We thank you for being with us today. Uh, I believe we're about ready to wrap things up for the afternoon. And, and a round of applause for you again, Karen. Yay, go for it. Awesome job. Uh, if I missed a question, then you will see. I'm going to take the screen back so we can get back to your last question uh, screen. You will see Karen on ampersand, ask Karen on Twitter. So that's her handle on Twitter, and she'll be available there for questions. So if you want to reach her, you have to sign up for a Twitter account. Uh, as you exit the webinar, we have three survey questions for you. We really do value your input and appreciate you taking the time to answer those. Thank you for sharing this learning opportunity. And to show how much we've learned from Karen, there's actually at the end of most of our webinars, we're not going to show it today, uh, but at the end of most of our webinars, there's all the contact information for our own social media accounts. So, uh, I'm very pleased that Greg has this up and running and off the ground and has been working to get our social media going. So, thank you so much, Karen. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. We are right on schedule. I think we're actually two minutes early, so everybody, you gain two minutes in your day. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.